Uh, I will start by uh, a few introductory uh, words. And then uh, Carlos will take the, the lead. Okay, so let me put, uh, let me share the screen. Here it is. Uh, voila. I want to, to enlarge it. Okay, can you see okay? Right now we see also okay. the, we also see the the following slide. So maybe you should uh, uh, click the. You see what? Sorry, we see the entire screen, and so we see. Yeah, now it's perfect. Okay, so uh, I'm very glad to open the uh, second meeting of uh, comparative urbanism. This is a series of lectures that we do once a month, uh, in which uh, in each lecture, we uh, concentrate uh, in the world. And what we want to look at is uh, the local dimension of uh, cities, not Uh, to open, uh, let me make reference uh, to uh, one of the most beautiful books about uh, cities, uh, and this is uh, Italo Calvino's Invisible Cities. As you know, in this book, uh, it goes like a conversation uh, between uh, Marco Polo and the Kublai Khan, in which uh, Marco Polo is talking, uh, is telling uh, Kublai Khan about uh, different cities uh, in the world. Now, in the in this uh, uh, book, Italo Calvino divided into uh, various kinds of cities, and this time, uh, this is uh, something that he calls continuous cities. And the fifth continuous cities is uh, uh, Penthesilia. This is what. Uh, well, here you can see uh, Marco Polo on the right, Kublai Khan on the left, and uh, uh, and uh, Marco Marco Polo is uh, talking about the Penthesilia, and he said the following: "You have given up trying to understand whether there exists a Penthesilia in the visit uh, the visitor can recognize and remember, or whether Penthesilia is only at the outskirt of itself." The question that now begins to gnaw at your mind is most anguish. Outside Pentencilia doesn't outside exist, or no matter how far you go from the city, will you only pass from one limbo uh, 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 to the other, uh, never manage, never managing uh, to leave uh, the city, man never managing to leave it. Now, uh, the question is, why uh, Calvino uh, used the name uh, Penthesilia to refer to such a city, a city one never managed to live. And Calvino doesn't tell us why. So here is a possible uh, interpretation or is a possible uh, uh, suggestion. Uh, and the suggestion is to go to your name and the name, as you know, uh, has its origin in Greek mythology and the Trojan, uh, Trojan uh, War. And Penthesilia uh, was, uh, according to the story, the queen of the Amazons, warrior women, who came to help uh, the Trojans in the war against the Greeks, headed by uh, Achilles. Now, in the battle, Achilles uh, killed Penthesilia, or Penthesilia, but then uh, when he lifted her uh, helmet, he saw her beauty and uh, fell in love with her. Uh, so, uh, can we link Achilles to the city that one uh, never managed to leave? Now, maybe there is a possibility via the story about Achilles uh, and, the, and the tortoise. Now, uh, the story goes like this. Uh, the Greek hero Achilles, the fastest man, 
conducted a, a foot race with the slow uh, tortoise. Graciously, Fast Achilles allowed the slow uh, guy a, a head start of 100 meters. But then, as the race started, something uh, strange uh, happened. By the time Achilles ran the 100 meters that brought him to the tallest uh, starting point, the tallest ran a certain much shorter distance, let's say one meter. During the time Achilles ran that one meter, the tallest and further, and so it continues. Whenever Achilles reached the tallest previous point, he still had to further to go uh, and uh, so on until infinity. Swift Achilles gradually realized he can never overtake the slow earliest. Uh, this is, of course, what paradoxes fifth century BC, uh, Socratic uh, philosopher Zeno from Elea in South Italy. Aristotle in physics summarized the story as follows. In a race, the quickest of overtake the slowest since the pursuer must first reach the point when the pursuer so the slower must always uh, hold the elite. Uh, of the same uh, with the cellar, which is uh, it's Oscar, you have to cross halfway uh, to its uh, uh, quarter way. Uh, to, and then and gradually you realize you will manage to leave uh, Penthesilea. So this was one note, uh, introductory, and here another one. The second one uh, starts with a sentence in response to a question about uh, the way science is going to develop uh, in the future. And he replied, I think that the next century Seems we lost Yuval. Yuval, at the at the Shomerati. Ah, זה זה נאסר מיוט אוטומטי פיתום. עכשיו זה בסדר, נדרה? עכשיו שומעים אותך. אוקיי. Now, cities are par excellence, par excellence complex system characterized by non-linearity, unpredictability, far from equilibrium, never in rest, while on the other hand by self-organization, etc. It is therefore not surprising that the 21st century is also called the age of cities. You uh, want and to see the יש קצת בעיה עם הקליטה שלך, יובל, אתה קטוע. שנייה. רואים? כן, יוסי? עכשיו כן. עכשיו כן. כן. כן, תרחיב את זה רק לכל המסך, אנחנו רואים חצי. אוקיי. אני אנסה להגדיל את זה. עכשיו רואים בסדר? כן. אוקיי. מצוין. טוב, נקווה לטוב. Cities are considered, or the 21st century is considered the age of... In, uh, the first time in history, uh, more than half of world population is living in cities, and 
For another or uh, parallel reason is that cities uh, grow in size and complexity beyond anything was known in the past. Uh, uh, and uh, they are, uh, to use, uh, uh, to use uh, Michael Batty world, they are reaching a point of singularity, uh, uh, which is very similar to what Calvino described as a city you will never manage to live. Uh, now cities that grow size and size are uh, uh, megacities or megalopolis or gigacities, and uh, today, uh, Carlos, Carlos Gershenson will tell us about the megalopolis of central Mexico. So Carlos, uh, please floor is yours. Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much for the invitation. Um, it seems for me to share the screen, you well, first you need to stop sharing yours. Yeah, yeah I, I just took it off. So uh, I will first give a general overview of evolution of human settlements, and then I'll focus on, on Mexico City in particular. So uh, throughout our history, we can identify three revolutions, the agricultural revolution, industrial revolution, and the information revolution. Uh, we can say that the first one dealt more with the control of matter, the second control of energy, and the third one, obviously, with the control of information. And it was thanks to the first that cities were able to, to arise, um, I mean, to, to have enough resources to uh, sustain um, large populations. But then this was expanded with Industrial Revolution. And now with information technology, we are having globalized cities in the sense that the distances, physical distances, when you are speaking about information become less relevant. So uh, let's say growing in complexity, first we had villages, uh, which I mean, arbitrarily we can define uh, to have a population of less than 10,000 people. Uh, of course, this was a huge leap from nomad tribes of around 100, 150 people. Uh, it allowed the specialization of different uh, things. Um, and also, it's, uh, I mean, we, we don't know whether it promoted cooperation, but it certainly required cooperation. So um, many mechanisms were developed to, to allow for this cooperation in, uh, among all the inhabitants of a village. Uh, and, and this was also a big cultural leap. And uh, I mean, the, the phrase that it takes a village to raise a, a, a child, uh, I think can be applied also, not only to our species, but to several species where, uh, let's say we are complex enough, our societies or our groups are complex enough that it's very difficult to reproduce or and survive if it's not in groups. Uh, I mean, not only humans also, uh, whales and elephants and uh, wolves. Uh, I mean, many, many species uh, require groups in order to survive. Uh, so I, I think even when we are not aware of the size of the organization that we are part of, uh, already from the beginning of our species, we, we had higher levels of organization that were relevant for our survival, individual survival. Um, so I, I think this is not something recent, but uh, something that actually characterizes our species and, and other species as well. So with the, uh, let's say, greater development of agriculture, we had cities. Uh, the greatest of, of the agricultural age was Angkor Wat, about a million people, uh, more or less the area of present day Berlin. Uh, you had walls and writing was developed and this required also coordination uh, among even more inhabitants and this led to, to the rise of states and empires. So again, th this was a transition in the level of organization and in the complexity of, of uh, settlements. And of course, one can write books about all the, the 
implications and requirements that these transitions had, but let's say just to have a overview of, of this evolution of uh, human settlements. Then we can speak about metropolises, uh, which have this, where the etymology comes from mother cities, where you have like a one big city that uh, serves other smaller cities uh, in, in Europe. The cities basically were defined as those with a cathedral and uh, therefore a bishop. And then this bishop would rule over certain region. And of course the transportation became relevant to uh, the area of influence of, of metropolises uh, when let's say people would only walk uh, this area was, let's say, somewhat limited to what distance uh, a human can walk or run uh, in, in a day or, or two. And um, let's say with horses, that increased a bit with the Industrial Revolution, with rail, that increased much more. And um, with cars and planes, that uh, increased e even more. So this led to the growth of metropolises because of the possibility of uh, more efficient transportation. And uh, megacities, some people define them as those settlements with more than 10 million inhabitants. Uh, there are more than 40 already uh, cities with this size and there will be more in, the, in this century reaching that, that population. Uh, but also uh, people are starting to speak about megalopolises uh, and these are basically ad adjacent metropolises and they are of the order of 100 million inhabitants. Uh, these megalopolises pose uh, several new challenges like multilevel governance that you have districts, cities, regions, nations, and co commonwealths or communities like the European Union where, where you have, let's say, the settlements that span across borders uh, in, in some cases, uh, uh, physical and political. And uh, let's say this poses challenges in, in, many, in many aspects. Uh, so uh, here there's a night satellite picture of the Yangtze Delta, uh, which includes Shanghai, uh, and it has uh, 105 million inhabitants. The Bohai economic ring, uh, which is uh, around Beijing, that has 65 million people. The Pearl River Delta, which includes um, Hong Kong, Shenzhen, Guangzhou, Macau, and many others. It has 10 cities of more than a million inhabitants, six metro systems, they're linked by high-speed rail, uh, 60 million people, and this is expected to grow. It's important to, know, to notice that uh, these uh, large settlements are being built uh, in, in places like China, where the primary source of population increase in urban areas is not uh, birth, but migration. Uh, so most cities nowadays are growing not because of people having more children, as it was the case in the 20th century, but uh, they're migrating from uh, agricultural land into urban areas. Um, in Japan, the so-called Taiheio Belt uh, has about 75 million inhabitants. It includes the metropolitan area of Tokyo, which is a megalopolis in itself, but also Nagoya metropolitan area, Kansai, which includes Osaka, and Kyoto and many others. Uh, and it goes all the way uh, along the, the train lines uh, to, to, let's say three, three of the main islands in, in Japan are included in, in this belt. Uh, so before, let's say, uh, having the scene between was a physical separation, but infrastructure manages to, to overcome those limits. Uh, Metro Manila, in the Philippines has about 40 million inhabitants. The island of Java has 145 million inhabitants. And again, this uh, includes several um, metropolises. Calcutta has about 65 million inhabitants. Around Delhi, you will find about six, uh, 46 million. Uh, around Mumbai, 80 million. 
and Chennai 20 million. So um, in, in Israel, you could say that most of Israel is already one large metropolitan area uh, from, from this nice picture, but it's difficult to distinguish it from Lebanon and Jordan uh, already and, and Syria. Uh, and in Egypt, you can see that it's basically the Nile and, and then the rest is desert. Uh, and, and it's interesting to notice that the desert and the sea can be more dividing than politics, religions, or ideologies. Uh, and of course, let's say the fact that two metropolitan areas are next to each other doesn't mean that they are interacting strongly, but there is a very strong push towards uh, integrating uh, so in, in Europe, you can also find several megalopolises. The so-called blue banana has about 111 million inhabitants. The, um, in, in United States, Boswash goes all the way from Boston, along New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Philadelphia, Washington DC, all the way to Virginia, has about 52 million people. And, it has also the world, world's largest economic output for, for um, megalopolis. Uh, I, I think if you consider this region a separate country, it would be like the third or fourth largest economy in the world. Uh, and here's a map of other megalopolis in North America. Uh, the Great Lakes megalopolis has about 60 million inhabitants. And, and of course, there are several advantages for having such huge settlements uh, thanks to economies of scale. So let's say there's a strong incentive to, to have this uh, organization at this scale uh, for economic purposes. And in, in Brazil, uh, it's interesting because Rio de Janeiro and Sao Paulo, you could say that each one is its own megalopolis, but they're already uh, merging when, when their physical distance is not so sh short. Um, it's one of the busiest uh, air routes uh, between Sao Paulo and, and Rio. Um, and this region has about 51 million people. So uh, finally, to, to, to speak about central Mexico, uh, also known as an, an AWAC, uh, you can see, well, politically, only this region is Mexico City, <laughs> and you can see that Megalopolis is overflowing uh, to, to other states. And the dark spots here are mountains and volcanoes. So uh, you, there are physical barriers, but let's say the urban areas just overflow them. Uh, so this is Toluca, uh, to the south, Cuernavaca and Cuautla, to the east, Puebla and Tlaxcala to the Northeast Pachuca, uh, uh, to the Northwest Querétaro. So uh, in spite of a lack of integration, I mean, for example, we, we don't have uh, proper, proper uh, railways. Um, let's say the, it's quite common, for example, uh, the main university campus is in south, south of Mexico City, and we have uh, another campus in the north of Cuernavaca. So to cross these mountains, the, the Ajusco uh, mountains, um, by road it's 80 kilometers, and you can do it in, in an hour or so. Uh, going downtown from here by car, it can easily be more than an hour. So many people live in Cuernavaca and work in Mexico City and vice versa. Similar to the west of the metropolitan area, uh, there's a new business district called Santa Fe, uh, it's high in the hills, so it's problematic for public transport. So many, <coughs> um, I mean, if, if you live in the east of the city, it can take you easily three hours to reach there. So some people live in Toluca, which is just on the other side of the mountains, uh, and they, they will do less than an hour to, to reach Santa Fe. So um, the, the, there are several advantages of having larger and larger settlements. And this have to do with urban scaling. So the work by Luis Petancourt and Geoffrey West and several others uh, have noticed that uh, there's a, a nonlinear 
uh, growth with population size. So for example, uh, as population grows, you need less uh, roads per inhabitant. Um, so it, it's, let's say, an economy of scale. And on the other hand, <coughs> uh, the economy is also uh, nonlinear, but here it's supralinear in the sense that uh, for larger settlements, the average uh, economic output per capita is greater. Now, people have looked at this in greater detail in recent years, and this increase of um, GDP in larger cities, it, it's heterogeneous in the sense that it's mainly, it mainly means that the rich people are richer in larger cities, not that everyone is richer in larger cities. So you have uh, more inequality in larger cities. Uh, well, and also you have, for example, more crime uh, and let's say other types of problems. Uh, also a few years ago, there, there was a work that uh, found that in, in rich countries, um, people had a smaller environmental impact in larger cities per capita. Uh, and I mean, if you imagine the United States, this makes sense because in small cities, everyone needs to move by car uh, and it's more expensive. And also the heating has greater waste. Um, so uh, per capita, you, you spend more energy. Uh, however, another study did a similar analysis for poorer countries and they found that the opposite was the case, that per capita, larger cities had a greater environmental impact. Uh, perhaps because in, in smaller towns, in poorer countries, uh, well, people don't have cars uh, and they don't move uh, so much and they don't have heating or airco, uh, which is not the case in large cities. And therefore, in cities, you have more pollution per capita. Uh, and a big question in, in this is how, how do you define a city? So, work by Sarah Kaute and and collaborators from UCL, uh, they um, propose um, a way for, uh, let's say, it's a um, percolation mechanism to try to define urban regions. So basically, you, you look at maps, and then you um, you check at what distance you have uh, intersections uh, and if, so for example, if in a hundred meters you still have inter an intersection, a street intersection, then you consider that that's still a part of the city. And as you increase the, the, uh, the parameter, in this case, it's a D, uh, in which you s consider the next intersection still part of the city, uh, you can see how different metropolitan regions uh, merge. So he, here for for uh, for K, uh, when this distance is very small, you have just like the big cities, and then as you increase this, uh, you you start seeing more uh, larger metropolitan areas, and then as you increase this, there's suddenly a shift, and uh, suddenly you have all of England uh, one metropolitan area, uh, and of course. This uh, distance threshold, uh, in in reality, has to do with how efficient transportation is. So, if you have very efficient transportation, then your metropolitan area can be hundreds of kilometers um, long. Uh, I mean, if if it's interconnected with with fast rail. Um, so, this is one of the reasons why let's say the metropolitan areas have been growing, and especially in Europe, it's not so much that the cities have been growing, but that they have been, they're being integrated. Uh, they're, they're becoming more and more dependent uh, on each other. So they're, they're becoming more and more difficult to separate. And the, the boundaries uh, are also becoming less relevant. So if we require a physical link, then we have bridges, we have ferries, we have tunnels, uh, also air bridges. So for example, the most uh, busy airplane route is between Seoul and Jeju, which is uh, an island. Uh, and it has about 15 million seats per year. So, okay, they, they, they don't have a physical link, but with airplane, uh, it, it's, let's say, uh, 
I, perhaps not integrated, but let's say the, the, they have very strong interaction. And with information technology, uh, this the, the relevance of boundaries is becoming less relevant, uh, even more after a pandemic. Uh, I mean, one example is the, the, the this talk now that I'm in the other side of the planet and we're able to, to interact uh, in real time. Uh, of course, this is restricted to certain activities that are related to information. If you are uh, in activities that are related to matter and energy, then you still need the, the physical link. But this leads to, to globalized activities. So uh, one of the terms for a global city would be an ecumenopolis. Uh, so in science fiction, there's uh, Trantor or Corcusant, uh, where you have planets that the whole planet is one single city or, or a global village. Um, and, and this, I mean, I, I don't know whether, I don't know, in a thousand years or less, we, we will reach such a level of, of organization because it requires not only infrastructure integration that, okay, we'll, <coughs> we'll just build better air routes or, I don't know, uh, faster internet, whatever, but you also need economic, social, cultural, and political integration. And to achieve this, we need to resolve conflicts. And uh, as, as we can see in the news every day, uh, this is very far from being achieved. Um, but then perhaps Let's say in a few centuries, the nation states will decrease the relevance just as city states did uh, in antiquity. Um, and of course, this, this will depend on whether global organizations will have greater power than the nations that now are dominating. And actually, th there's another uh, theory. I, I mean, you, there's this book, When Mayors Will Rule the World, that says that actually cities are uh much more close to to uh let's say action uh, so, so to speak uh than nations so uh for example to face climate change it's more relevant to have a coordination between mayors of the great largest cities in the world rather than waiting for presidents uh, and prime ministers to to agree on something all encompassing um of course, only time will will say which levels of organization will be more appropriate for solving different types of global conflict. Uh, and I mean, this this is still very far in the future, so so we can just speculate uh, about this. But I mean, if if we have seen this increase in hierarchical organization of human settlements throughout history, uh, there's nothing that suggests that they will stop. And okay. Now we reach a limit and we will not develop new technologies that will prevent us from, from increasing the, the hierarchies. There, there are advantages to this integration at higher scales and very probably this will continue even when we can't foresee which type of technologies this will be or when they will be available. Okay, so uh, shifting gears now to Mexico City. So do, do you hear the audio? I think I didn't share the audio. Let me, sorry, let me, no, we don't. let me try again with the audio. So this is just a one minute video of Mexico City to give an idea of the scale. So we have the largest wholesale market in the world, the whole city. Also the university campus has, uh, it's also called a university city. The, the National University has 350,000 students. Llegar al centro atravesarlo es un desmoche. Un hormiguero no tiene tanto animal. So it's a extremely complex multi-scale organizational system. So 
we'll, we'll go along a bit of its history to understand better how, how we reach the state we have now and all the problems that we have. So in the, in the valley, already in the fifth century, uh, there, there was Teotihuacan, uh, uh, which had a large area of influence. Uh, if you come to Mexico City, you can go to the ruins that are about 40 kilometers from downtown Mexico City. Um, in its heyday, it had between 100 and 200,000 inhabitants. So it was one of the largest cities of the time. Uh, it was abandoned between the seventh and eighth centuries. Uh, we don't know precisely why, there are many theories. Uh, and actually, we don't even know how they called themselves. So the Teotihuacan was the name that the Mexics gave them, uh, let's say, in, or, or when they founded Tenochtitlan uh, much later. So the Tenochtitlan was founded uh, 700 years ago. Um, so the, they, they were from the northwest of, of current Mexico and they migrated and there was a legend that they should settle where they would see an eagle devouring a serpent on a, on a cactus. And that's why it's our, our national symbol and on the flag and everything. Um, and, and they found this in, in the center of Mexico Valley in, a, in an island. So there was the technology of chinampas, which I'll, I'll speak more about in, in a moment, uh, that allowed them to, to have a very high yield in a relatively small area for food. So they were able to grow their city estimates go between 200 and 400,000 inhabitants. And their empire uh, had about 5 million people uh, from, from coast to coast to the Gulf, from the Gulf of Mexico to the Pacific Ocean. Um, and these chinampas, which now you can see in Xochimilco or Tlahuac still, and people are still using them to grow food for, for the city. Uh, basically you have channels, well, because there were, there were several lakes in the valley. Uh, so let's say in, in small islands that are surrounded by channels with very fertile ground taken from the depths of the lake, which are relatively shallow. Uh, then you, let's say, everything grows and you don't need to water the plants because the, the water is right next to them. So it's, it's uh, allowed them to grow very, very fast and well, also by conquering the, the neighboring lands. So um, th this is a map of the valley uh, around the time the Spaniards arrived. So the, it had several lakes. Um, most of which are, are non-existent anymore, or there are few remains of, of these lakes. So Tenochtitlan was an island in the center. Only the, the nobles were allowed to, to live on the main island and the commoners had to live uh, beyond. And many of these towns which were around the, the lakes are now part of the city. Uh, you will see how the city has been growing. Uh, I mean, now all of this is metropolitan area. Uh, except for, for the mountains. Uh, but yeah, the, the towns uh, were swallowed by this growth. So uh, 500 years ago, the Spaniards conquered Tenochtitlan and they uh, tried to dry the channels to, to make streets as you will have in any European city and in most European cities and they built palaces. And uh, of course, this was not, um, let's say, without problems because they, there were floods every rain season in the summer uh, until the 20th century that, uh, let's say, a system for taking water out of the valley was, was implemented. Actually, uh, at some point, the city was flooded in such a, I'd say so, so badly that the capital moved to Puebla for a year. Um, so you, you can see that, let's say, the whole city was relatively small. Uh, here's a park, the Alameda, which uh, will serve us as a reference to, to, to see how the city has grown. This would be the cathedral and main square. 
Um, and then 200 years ago was the independence. And you can see the Alameda. Uh, no, uh, now I can see the Alameda. <laughs> Let me see. Um, so the, this is Chapultepec, and he, here's the park. So let's say it, it grew a lot. So the, this map shows the growth in the 19th century. So the red area perimeter is uh, in independence. And then the map shows more or less the, the city at the time of the revolution in 1910. Um, and the main square is somewhere here. So by, by 1930, uh, the city had already a million inhabitants and yeah, the Alameda is like very tiny. <laughs> here, uh, this Chapultepec Park, and it started growing to the south, more than to the north. Uh, and, and then in, during the 10, 20th century, the population had a, a, it doubled every 20 years, more or less. So uh, here, let's say you can see how the metropolitan area grew, uh, but you can see that already several states are part of the, uh, in, in this map. So let's say the lighter colors are 1950, and it was just an explosive growth all along the 20, 20th century. Then it decreased, it has decreased a bit, but of course it still keeps on growing. Uh, here on a satellite image, you can see like the pavement and the, the dark, uh, green are forests in the mountains. Uh, in, in the highest volcanoes, there are more than 5,000 meters above sea levels. We used to have glaciers, but uh, with global warming, they, they, they have been lost. Uh, so yeah, we, we have tundra out there uh, in the mountains and well, lots of volcanoes. Um, and let's say you can see that all this will be the, the Mexican megalopolis, more than 30 million people. And we have problems at multiple scales from going to the next valley, like from Toluca to Mexico City. Uh, they have been trying to build a train uh, already for I don't know how many years um, and problems with corruption and over costs and ma many problems. Uh, and let's say to the very local last mile problems in, in different regions. So let's say th there are many things that, um, let's say increase the complexity. So also, for example, in Cuernavaca here, the altitude is about 150,000 meters above sea level. So it's a tropical climate. In Toluca, it's about 2,500 or 600, so it's actually very cold. Uh, Mexico City is 2,200, so it's more temperate. Uh, so yeah, there's lots of variations in very, very, uh, at very short distances. So many of the problems that we have uh, are related with, with water, in, in spite of having uh, been surrounded by lakes, um, the, the um, water dynamics in, in the whole region, not only in, in the Anahuac Basin, but in the neighboring basin, is such that we are losing water every year. So because of the paving of uh, large areas, when it rains, it does not refill the uh, Let's say the underground wells, uh, about 70% of the water of the city is taken from wells. Uh, about 30% is taken from two basins uh, ahead. So let's say here is the basin of, of Anahuac or Mexico, where we used to have the lakes. Uh, here's this is the basin of Lerma in Toluca. And here you can see uh, a dam. Uh, no, sorry, here in Valle de Bravo, there's a dam in the basin of Cuzamala. So we bring water from Valle de Bravo, which is more than 100 kilometers, uh, to, <coughs> to Mexico City. 
And of course, we're taking water from this basin. And not only that, but we are, um, let's say the rainwater mixes with the wastewater. So this has to be pumped out of the valley so that the valley doesn't flood. Uh, and this is thrown to the north to the basin of Tula. Uh, and well, it's a not so nice cycle because let's say all the dirty water goes to Tula and then it, it's used for agriculture and then we eat that agriculture that uh, is produced with, with that dirty water. And this, since most of the water is taken from the, the wells, uh, the city has been sinking and it's another problem and it's becoming more and more difficult to prevent floodings uh, in several parts of the city. Uh, we also have earthquakes, we have margination, inequality, <laughs> and also crime. That's not such a big problem as in other parts of the country. Uh, but one of the most problematic aspects of living in such a megalopolis is mobility. So I, I, I will focus on, on mobility. Um, I mean, Mexico City had the not so prestigious distinction of be, uh, being judged in 2014 by IBM as the most painful commute in the world, uh, simply because many people spend four hours or more every day commuting. Uh, and of course, this has a huge impact. Uh, so we, we can identify eight factors that determine urban mobility. The first one is uh, the requirement to move. So if, if you live, let's say, here in Iztapaluca and you need to work in Santa Fe or study in Coyoacán, then let's say there's a huge mobility demand. If, if there were universities and workplaces closer to where people live, then this would reduce uh, the mobility demand. But unfortunately, that, that's not the case. With remote work, that could be decreased. And in the pandemic, it was shown that it can be done uh, for, for certain uh, professions, uh, but now many people are going back to, to uh, let's say, physical offices, and of course, this has a huge effect in, in traffic and saturation of public transport and, and so on. Another factor is the schedules. If everyone enters, uh, starts work at 9 a.m. or school at 8 a.m., uh, then you have rush hours. If you have flexible schedules, then let's say the, the peaks can be uh, diffused. So some people enter earlier, some people enter later and so on. And uh, another factor, it's the, the, um, the capacity of your infrastructure. If you have more streets, uh more public transportation then you can have greater mobility but in some cases when you increase your infrastructure you are actually generating more demand and uh, this is also known as bryce paradox when you increase the demand greater than the one you are trying to satisfy so actually the effect is counterproductive the quantity of passengers in public transport or cars on the streets is detrimental to urban mobility it's just they just become saturated uh, another factor is um, the, the infrastructure. Uh, so, so if we can devise better ways of regulating mobility systems, then of course it will be more efficient. This is one of the aspects we, we have focused on. Uh, another factor is uh, the, the social aspect. Um, in, in many countries, it's still uh, desirable to own a car because it seemed like a sign of economic success. So in many cases, people prefer to go by car to wherever they are going, even when it's more expensive and takes more time than alternative modes of transport. Um, and um, also the, the behavioral aspect is very relevant. So depending on how people drive or how passengers behave in public transport, this can make more or less efficient the, the mobility. And finally, the regulations and uh, plans uh, will, let's say, be able to, to uh, make mobility more or less uh, problematic. And in Mexico City, we do have 
several plans and several regulations, only that these are not enforced. So it's equivalent as not having, and, and then you have uncontrolled city growth and uh, lots of problems that derive from that. So uh, ju just to share some graphs, more or less the population in recent years uh, has been growing linearly, uh, but the number of vehicles has been growing supralinearly in recent years. Uh, however, the infrastructure has been growing sublinearly simply because there's no space to, to build more streets or more metro or BRT. Uh, so th let's say, of course, this, this is leading to worse and worse mobility. Um, however, of course, there can be several improvements. So this video was taken a few years ago, one of the stations in Mexico City Metro. So if, if you want to enter the train, you need to do it through the windows because there is no space. Actually, this is the ladies and children section of the train. So yeah, the, there's this division because of harassment. Um, so even if people don't want to push, if you don't push, you won't enter the train and you won't reach your destination. So people are forced to they shove their way into the train. And at the moment where you need greater capacity, this is reduced most. So we can ask how, how to change behavior and let's say after an intervention we did, this is the same station, but now people are organized in a different way. They start queuing and then they leave space for people to go out. The queues go all, all the way outside the platform and up the stairs. And if you can see, it's not that we brought uh, Japanese passengers or some other nationality that they, they might be more ordered than Mexicans. It's the same Mexicans, just that we changed the way they're interacting. And this was done with um, signals on the platform, basically telling where the uh, doors will be. And we were just hoping that they will leave that area free so that uh, people could go out without clashing. Uh, and we, we didn't know they would start queuing uh, to the point that even in stations without the signals, people started queuing because of course these new rules benefit everyone. So uh, people enforce these rules. Um, if you impose rules that need enforcement, then uh, there's something wrong with your rules. Uh, and the, the best rules are those that benefit individuals. So they will be sure that the rules are uh, followed. And this video was taken uh, in another station sometime after these interventions were made. So it's completely packed, but people are organized in a different way as opposed to the other video. And this is just one example of a system where you cannot change the elements. So it kind of suggests that let's say an alternative to dealing with complex systems is not to change the elements, but to regulate their interactions. Uh, so we cannot change politicians, but maybe we can change the interactions so that <coughs> there will be uh, better governance and less corruption. We cannot change business people, but maybe we can change their interactions so that uh, there, there will be greater economic growth and less inequality. So just another example that has to do with traffic light coordination. Uh, but just a disclaimer, if you improve traffic just like that, you are basically generating more demand for traffic. So if a city implements such a system, it should go along with a program to reduce the, the number of vehicles on the streets, or at least to, to limit the number of vehicles on the streets. Because suddenly it, it gets, uh, you, let's say there is less traffic and then more people will use cars and you you will have worse traffic and more pollution instead of the opposite. So there's some abstract simulations, traditional methods of traffic light coordination leads to gridlock uh, for the same density, the self-organizing method where you have sensors in each intersection that give preference to the street with greatest demand. 
for this density, you have optimal performance, meaning that every intersection is being used constantly, so you cannot do better than that. With a PhD student, we extended this and compared it also with autonomous vehicles. So it turns out that if you have autonomous vehicles, but traditional traffic lights, this is less uh, of an improvement than if you have human drivers with self harnessing traffic lights. If you have both, then it's even better. But if you had to choose one, it's better the self harnessing traffic lights and um, much cheaper than, than the cost of autonomous vehicles nowadays. And we also use self organization to regulate public transportation systems. So the theory tells us that in order to minimize waiting time stations, uh, you, you need to have equal headways. So the time between vehicles should be the same. Uh, the problem is that this is unstable. So there's a positive feedback. If there's one delay, then this will amplify and then you end up with all the vehicles bunched up. So, it's, so this is also known as the bus, bus bunching problem. So, uh, however, uh, we were inspired by ant colony communication, uh, and it's a very simple algorithm. Basically, you try to keep the same distance to your neighboring vehicles, and this leads to a performance that is better than the theoretical optimum, and it's because the theoretical optimum was making the wrong assumptions. Um, okay. You can see a plot of, uh, let's say, the trains moving uh, in space. This is a simulation of the first metro line in Mexico City. So let's say the trains move and reach a station, and then they go to the next station, and then there's a disruption, and the system collapses and cannot recover with the traditional method. Uh, with self organization since the vehicles try to keep the same distance to their neighbors, uh, there's this disruption, so vehicles cannot advance. The vehicles in front start slowing down so that they don't leave such a huge gap like here uh, between vehicles. And this leads to a very quick recovery of, of the system. So uh, the solutions to <coughs> improve urban mobility in, in megalopolises are uh, several. The, the, as I mentioned, there are at least eight factors. So you will not have a single solution that will address everything. Uh, but in general, we can speak about reducing demand, increasing capacity, and regulating interactions. Uh, and, and you need basically to implement several solutions in parallel in order to, to improve mobility. The question is whether we can do this faster than the demand grows and mobility worsens. Uh, maybe there are some lessons from, from the pandemic. Um, and even when population is not growing as much as it used to be, uh, migration continues. So we have unforeseen challenges and certainly new problems will arise. And from my experience, most of this have to do with uh, human factor in the sense that you can already have a solution for a problem, but then uh, when you speak with people from government or from businesses or from society, of course, they all agree that we should improve mobility, but then how to do it then let's say we start having differences and uh i mean it's it's very problematic we need to find the proper mechanisms to promote cooperation among different sectors in order to solve these type of problems um and the science of cities will certainly help uh, the more we understand about how cities grow uh how they different actors at different scales interact then we will be able to regulate better urban systems So I, I hope there's time for questions. Thank you, Carlos. It was very interesting. Uh, my, my internet connection is unstable, but uh, um can you hear me okay carlos yes yeah i uh, first of all thank you very much for uh, how to call it comprehensive complex uh, review of urbanism from uh, 
early days to uh, actually to the future. So uh, this is one thing. Uh, the other thing, I'm, uh, so I used to be uh, in technology, and there was an interesting study by someone called uh, McAdams. Uh, in which uh, he made comparison between uh, uh, Central America, what you have shown today, and the uh, uh, early urbanization in the Near East. And the question was, uh, uh, did the two urban culture uh, evolve independently of each other, or were there some uh, uh, connections? Because, uh, there are a lot of uh, similarities in the in the early emergence of uh, of uh, urbanism, despite the fact that there are, of course, many uh, differences. But there are striking similarities. So uh, uh, so th this so this this was uh, uh, really uh, interesting. Uh, this is one uh, a comment. It might be interesting to compare. <clears throat> Once again, urbanism in the Near East and uh, uh, Central America to see uh, what happened since, uh, yes. let's say, 5,000 years ago uh, and today in the two places. Yes. Uh, yeah. uh, uh, in, indeed, there are similarities. And also, for example, one of the most ancient civilizations in Mesoamerica, where the Olmecs, uh, which inhabited close to the Gulf of Mexico, and they have these uh, monumental heads. And some of these, you could say that they have African um, uh, oh, the, 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 some, some pieces look African with thick lips. Uh, uh, but from what we know of genetic studies, uh, there was no mixing uh, with Native Americans until 500 years ago. So uh, uh -huh. the Vikings reached North America a thousand years ago, but <laughs> they were basically uh, killed by the, the natives. So of course they didn't mix and they didn't leave their genes. And then there were also some similarities with Polynesian cultures and Southern America and in the Pacific. And of course, Easter Island is closer to South America than to uh, Asia, but uh, again, there is no genetic inheritance in the local cultures. So in this way, it might have been that th there was some influence, but at least it was minimal because they didn't reach um, descendants, let's say, the genes they, they were not mixed um and yeah, i mean there, there are legends that suggest that some europeans arrived in central mexico beforehand so when cortez arrived in uh, 1518 uh he was considered to be uh quetzalcoatl which is one of the gods and venus or well, the, the planet venus uh, is considered as quetzalcoatl the feather uh -huh. serpent and the legend told that um, there had been a bearded guy, Quetzalcoatl, coming on a year one atl. So the, in Mesoamerica, there's a 52-year calendar combining the, the cycles of the sun and the moon. Uh, and he, he was here and left again in a year one atl. So it was expected that he would come back in a year one atl, and Cortez came in year one atl. Uh, mm. So, well, in the in the field of the interpretation, at least the legend tells that there was a bearded guy coming from the sea, uh, and whether it was uh, European uh, sailor who kind of got lost. Um, also, it seems that the Chinese uh, were around these parts in the 15th century, but let's say they didn't mix with the natives at all. So um, probably there was influence, but genetic evidence suggests that it wasn't very strong in the sense that let's say they were mixing, um, or at least they didn't survive.
and, and another suggestion that there the wasn't much contact is that when the Europeans arrived in the Americas, uh, they brought diseases that were not here before, and this created, let's say, um, millions of deaths uh, in Central America and, and in North America and in South America. So this suggests that there was no previous contact or it was minimal um, because of, otherwise our ancestors would have the antibodies. Yeah, interesting. Uh, it's Benenson. It's hard. Uh, you wanted the. Yes, I did. Yeah. Um, according to the lecture, I'm very disciplined. I raised my hand. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you very much, Carlos. Very interesting lecture. And it took me to the examples of good transportation systems in mega policies that I remember. When I count them, they are not numerous, like Tokyo or London or Singapore or Hong Kong. I immediately recall that all these cities have very strong limitations on cars. Let's take an yes. example of Tokyo. You cannot buy a car until you have your own parking place. That means, I'm sorry, that means you have car ownership at the level of 40% in Tokyo, which never raises. So all these cities have very si similar dynamics of the transportation system. Actually, it's more or less smooth until some disruption happens. So usually this disruption may destroy greatly a large piece of the system until the night, and then the next day it's restored. So my impression, and it's actually a question, is that self-organization uh, has limited power in all the systems. So until you don't put the system into the very strict frame, self-organization can help, uh, cannot help, let's say. But what's your impression from your yeah. studies, from your example? Yes. Yes, in our in our case study, self organization is useful for regulating, uh, in short time scales, um, problems that are changing constantly. So the technical term is non stationary. So, for example, every time a train reaches a station, there will be a different number of passengers at the platform and in the train. So, if you are trying to predict, uh, let's say, the schedules for the trains and when passengers will arrive, this is changing constantly. So instead of trying to optimize uh, for a prediction that is not <laughs> predictable because of its inherent complexity, uh, self-organization allows the system to adapt by itself. So th that is, let's say, for uh, short time scales, let's say, for re regulation of, of these uh, transportation systems. But the planning side and the policy side, those are also very relevant. As, as I was mentioning, if if you just allow cars to, to keep on growing, doesn't matter if you have very smart traffic lights, if there's no space on the streets, uh, you will have constant gridlock. So, um, and, and in some cases, these policies can reduce the complexity of the problem. So then it's a, it kind of dissolves. Um, and, and yeah, I, I guess that in many cases, there's not like a single solution or single best strategies, uh, whether, for example, you want some centralized solution or a distributed solution. So for example, in Singapore, that they have these quotas um, on how many people from, different from the same nationality can inhabit in a same building to prevent the formation of ghettos. Uh, that's like a top-down approach, but it seems to have been successful in a way to, to avoid uh, racial conflicts and promote integration in their hugely diverse uh, city. So um, for, for that aspect, it seems it has been successful. 
but from what we've seen, if you want to, let's say, centrally tell, like for example, all the all the traffic lights what to do, then it's easier if, if you just let them self-organize, or or if you try to tell every train or every bus, uh, let's say, to to have a schedule that will never be <laughs> followed because uh, the shifting demands and traffic, uh, that, then for those cases, self-organization seems to be more appropriate. Yeah. Also, I, I, I remember yeah, a talk I heard a, yeah, a few more, years ago about... Work. Yeah, it's... I, I, I remember a talk about urban areas in Israel so if I remember properly in the 1980s, there was a, a global plan for the whole country telling, okay, cities will grow only in these places. So, so they kind of um, set the land use for different regions at a very, yeah, I mean, almost uh, lot by lot of uh, plot of land. Um, and uh, so there were agricultural, use and industrial use and urban use so this regulation told that cities could only grow in the urban areas but then uh, of course that increased the price of these uh, lands and it the agricultural lands had uh, were i don't know 10 times or more cheaper uh, but then people would buy these agricultural lands and then lobby so that they would change the land use uh, because then it would be good business uh, so after 15 years or so, they made an analysis and about half of the grow urban growth of Israel was outside the plan because the dynamics was such that the planning made it, uh, it, it made a strong incentive for going against the plan. So <laughs> it was counterproductive. Yeah. I, I, I don't know what would have been the better solution. But, yeah. Sorry? I think you are talking about paper of Nurit al and myself because we did that analysis. I recall that. Ah, well, maybe. Yeah, yeah. Maybe. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, more uh, questions, comments? Uh, yeah, I, I have one until. Uh, um, what is uh, what is uh, interesting is that we are using the the word uh, city if uh, uh, it has a single meaning. Now, mm -hmm. uh, looking at the name, uh, the uh, the meaning of the of the the word city, uh, it's very it becomes obvious that is, uh, it is changing all the time. Uh, you see in the, let's say uh, uh, five or 4,000 years ago, a city could have been a settlement of uh, 10 dunams. Today, 10 dunams is the size of a single building or a single high rise. Uh, I have excavated as an archeologist, the site uh, which is about 10 dunam. It had uh, all the, you know, aspects of a city, city wall, gate, streets, everything. But uh, it's like a miniature compared to today. So uh, in fact, I think that the very meaning of the word city uh, is changing all the time, even today. I can give you another example. For example, if you take uh, uh, if you take the Bible, and if you check, this is something I did some years ago. If you check the the meaning of the word uh, uh, city or the connection within which it appears, actually the word city is what we in our language today call settlement. This is why you have agricultural city, you have a fortal city. You have a royal city, and you have all kinds of different cities. Uh, uh, and in fact, until uh, very recently, the main uh, economy of cities uh, was actually 
agriculture and the uh, in which he uh, show that uh, even a Neolithic column of hunters and gatherers uh, uh, can uh, buy the economic foundation uh, uh, for a city. So I think that the world city is a uh, self-organized entity that is changing uh, uh, during time. Yes, indeed. Yes, and um, the the role of boundaries is uh, say more and more difficult to identify because before it's like, okay, there are the city walls and then that's the end of the city. But of, of course, as the city grew, let's say, let's say uh, th there were more houses outside the walls and then there would be another layer of walls. Uh, I'm not thinking about European cities uh, that several have like several walls that were growing as the city grew. Um, uh -huh. But let's say it seems that modern settlements have uh, less respect for these boundaries, either rivers or mountains or uh, the sea or anything. Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh... No comments. Um, uh, I, yeah. I, I have a comment. So um, I think in addition to uh, the, um, I think there's also heterogeneity in the, um, maybe the configuration or the, the way that the city grows. So it can go, grow uh, organically in some places. Uh, maybe when there is a, uh, the, the areas where there is a lot of poverty and the growth is a kind of uh, not organized and not planned. And then some parts are uh, urban development and they're well planned and um, they have, um, certain uh, land uses and uh, they want to be more organized, but it doesn't always work that way. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I guess there are examples of both extremes, cities that grow perhaps too organically and then it's a mess. And then cities that are completely planned from the top down. Um, I mean, I'm thinking about some Soviet cities or in China or perhaps Brasilia, but then the planning was so, uh, let's say, optimal in, in such a way that it's difficult for these cities to adapt to the use that people make of, of the infrastructure. So, it, I mean, with the example of Brasilia, even when it was designed for cars, it was not designed for, for the amount of cars that they have now. So it's uh, problematic. It's, I think, also because the rapid growth of the population and the planning and the building is not uh, keeping up with this uh, growth. Yeah. Yeah, I, I guess that most of uh, urban management is fixing problems that were that shouldn't have been there in the first place with, with proper planning uh, or, or because of legacy. Uh, I mean, you, you can see it in medieval cities where the cars don't fit in the width of the of the streets. Um, but that, now we can say that that's an advantage. But um, I mean, since cities have evolved throughout different technologies, and then we are trying to adapt the new technologies to the existing cities, that limits how much can we do. Like, uh, if you want to, to introduce a new rail line, but there is no space because the city is already grow, uh, has already grown, uh, where do you get the space from? Uh, so it could be an elevated line, but then of course that has other problems. 
uh, and so on, or, or underground, and it has other problems as well. Thank you. It's very interesting. Yeah. Comments, more comments. Uh, okay. I see uh, that. Yeah. Please go ahead. Thank you. Th thank you, Carlos. Thank you, uh, City Center, for this event. Uh, I was wondering uh, because it's a fascinating process of of uh, change in, 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 the, in Mexico City. I was wondering if we can call it evolution because it, uh, with such a dramatic changes of civilizations of political systems, but its, its civilization and its political system picks up even to destroy them, the, the, the marks of the previous system. So although sometimes these elements are destroyed, I mean, canals were used for, for streets and then streets are used to plan uh, subway systems. In each way, this evolution contradicts, this urban evolution, if you can talk about that, contradicts the political history that is always talking about cuts and, and new regimes and et cetera. Yes, well, uh, actually, many of the modern day avenues of Mexico City were traced uh, by the Mexicas before the Spaniards arrived. So it, it is um, indeed some legacy that let's say you cannot change easily, and uh, I, I guess also there's not much point in changing or throwing away something that you can build on. Uh, but yeah, I mean, the evolution has been very fast. So my, my grandmother was born in 1935. Uh, so when, when she was a girl, um, city was, I don't know, maybe 2 million people. And you still had some channels and rivers. In the, now we have just one river left. Um, and uh, I mean, there were a few cars, but not <laughs> I mean, we have I don't know like 10 million cars in the metropolitan region something like that um, so of course the the changes have been very fast uh, looking at, at that from that perspective but from another perspective you could say well if it takes a few years then it's already takes time <laughs> it, it, it allows people to adapt um, and, and also, we tend to adapt very quickly, uh, since that our, our metro is about 50 years old. Uh, and when it opened, it was like a big change. Uh, but then people adapt to it very quickly. Uh, so, so you kind of absorb it as part, part of the city. Yeah. OK. Uh, time is running very fast. Uh, we have uh, maybe time for one more comment or question. Anyone? Uh, if not, Carlos, thank you for a fascinating talk. And uh, I hope that uh, next time uh, we do it in person in uh, Tel Aviv. That would be great. And. Uh, you already have an open invitation. Great, thank you very much.